to the promised land to take hold of the promised land for that promised land, for that promise to be fulfilled in their lives. Due to rebellion, of course, even after leaving, leaving Egypt, they had still did not take it because they rebelled when they got to the promised land. They did not believe God, they saw the man enter in and they saw wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. And it was only after 40 years that they finally entered in and started taking hold of the promised land. The land that God had promised to, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. So although they had left Egypt, Egypt was so very much alive in their hearts. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai to meet with God, what did that people do? And they made a golden calf. A calf made out of gold and said, Look, your God who brought you out of Egypt. It didn't take him long for them to, to reject God who actually brought him out of Egypt the real, true, living God, to make gods in the image of things, of, a, of animate or inanimate animate things, and say, this is your God. So, we might have left our uh, Egypt, we might have left the world, we might have left the past, but as the world left us, was a soul alive in our hearts, that is hindering us from taking hold of all that God has promised to us. You know, God doesn't allow to coexist. We can choose one for the other. In order for us to move into all that God has for us, the all needs to die within us so that we can have all that God has for us. We can't have both Egypt and the Promised Land. We can't have the world and Christ. We cannot have a whole religion and all that is found in Jesus. We can't have it both. We cannot have it all. We have to give up the old to take hold of the new. Let us read Matthew 9, 14 to 17. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often but your disciples do not fast. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn? Christ is with them. The time will come when the bridegroom will take and take it from them. Then they will fast. No one sows a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the, the day worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Here we see Jesus given the depiction of the old and the new. Old wine skins, and old wine is put into old wine skins. New wine is put into new wine skins. You know, wine's burst. Because what happens is they, the, the wine isn't fully matured yet when they put it into the wine skins. They put it in and during the ferment when it ferments, during the fermentation process, due to the gases of the, the fermenting wine, there's an expansion. It's like uh, you know the when you shake a bottle or the old um, and of, of uh, carbonated water, the gases are released, and there's actually you'll see a bottle floating, a plastic bottle. Same with the wine skins. But the the wine skins expand. Now, if you put new wine into old wine skins, the old wine skins have become hard and brittle. So instead of expanding, they burst. And so you lose not only the wine skin, and that is just completely useless now, destroyed, and can't be used for old wine. But the wine is lost because it's built 
Not as a separate way. You have to use new wild skins because the wild skins are made out of animal hides that are that are still flexible, that they can uh, still got the flexibility and expansion in them and can expand with the, the fermenting wine. And so <coughs> therefore new wine has to be prone to new wine skins. <coughs> so here we, we see the insignificance of the old life. Matthew 9 14. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? John's disciples, as genuine as they were, so re represented the old life under the law. They had experienced the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance. Yes, they had repented, and they had turned their back on, on simple ways to follow not Jesus, but the law. To do what was right according to their thinking as Jews. What are we going to do if we have to repent? Well, carry out the law. That is the most logical thing for people still under the law to do. But they had not yet realized that they had stopped following Jesus. So they sort of represented those under the law. And they identified more with the Pharisees because now they follow the law, then it was Jesus who got to not the new law but for grace. And so they didn't understand this new aspect of grace as yet. Many of them came to faith in Christ, of course, and did come to identify with Jesus. But at this stage, they still not, uh, did not know what Jesus was really about. Although the question was about fasting, they could have, they probably could have questioned Jesus about any other practices of the law that him and his disciples seemed to be contravening uh, of the law and the traditions. Could have been not keeping the Sabbath or not washing your hands or doing the ritual washings before you eat. But at this stage, it was uh, particularly about fasting. Hey, why don't you and your disciples fast? You know, why don't your disciples fast? You know, we fast, the Pharisees fast, but you don't fast. In other words, why aren't you keeping the law and the traditions? Why aren't you? Everyone's following you, you're leading people to. Are you leading people to break the law? Are you leading us? The question when, when people under the law really are asking. Are you leading us into a curse? Because cursed is everyone who does not keep everything in this law. That's what they really, really the real fear is. When you live under the law, you fear that if people are leading people away from the law, that God is going to put a bigger curse on the land, and that we've got a bigger enough, big enough curse for the fact that we live in an oppression of the Romans, and now you want to bring a war upon us? That's really the big fear of the Jews and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the teachers of the law and now they John's disciples. Fearing that a greater curse would come upon them if they did not adhere to the, not only did not adhere to it, but led people away from it. Why don't you do that? Well, that they are often facing them enough. And this is what religious people do. Misinterpreting where God is and what God wants to do in our lives because of rigidity of the old ways. They lived within the rigid structures of the old wild skins and were inflexible and legalistic. <coughs> it is, and it was the standard, this was the standard of which they judged others. <coughs> and, but, and while they couldn't understand any way outside of that life and that type of structure, that's what we know as Jews. That's what is right in our sight. How can we not adhere to it? Therefore, that, that their judgment on others outside of that is according to that legalism 
have inflexibility. There's nothing we can't, surely we can't be flexible if we are stuck in our ways to think outside the box, to think of the new ways of life that Christ has brought. Maybe our old lives weren't religious and legalistic, but maybe they were plain worldly and plain sinful. You know, some people well, were, never, were never religious. They were party people, going to parties and drinking and all that stuff, not religious. They was the, the old life. Others, and that's, that's what I remember from, from growing up. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up in a religious home. So, well, the life that I came from was more a I went to Sunday school, my, my folks said to go to church, but they were happy to talk to me in Sunday school. Even though they would be happy to, they would go play uh, sports on a Sunday, talk to me in Sunday school, they would go play sport on a Sunday, after the sport they would go sit in the bar, drink, um, and you know, we, they would be happy to go to sports functions, which would normally be a big party, things like this. That's the, those are the things that the way I grew up. But fortunately, we have been, I'm grateful that, that both my folks came to the Lord eventually. And um, but, so some of our, I would say they were, uh, you know, they weren't religious, they were more worldly. So that was my background of what, what I came from. Even though I was maybe more religious than them because I'm going to Sunday school and youth group, that, um, that was my one choice and, and um, not because of the way I was raised. And then, of course, you get others who are not religious, not particularly worldly in the sense of partying and drinking and all that, and uh, smoking and, and uh, this kind of stuff, but they just make it different. You know, they rather just sit at home, rather just get on with their own life, go to work, sit at home, indifferent, they just live and they live. Why well, bother me? My well, life is good, I'm happy being alone, I'm not doing anything wrong, I'm not harming anyone, I'm not, I'm not a party person, I'm not a bully person, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I just, but then, of course, they just don't follow Jesus. So what? These, these are different scenarios of what our past might look like. Um, you know what your past is like before coming to faith in Christ. It could have been ambitious. Sometimes it could be religious as well as worldly. Sometimes we sit, people sit in church, yet so on Sundays and go to parties and sit in out and sit in church on Sundays. You know, things like that. So it's a mixture. So, what is our past? When someone sees Jesus and, the, and those who are following Jesus and what they're doing, uh, they're not doing things that they're familiar with. The religious people can't understand why we are not religious in their way of religion. Why? Wow, they can't. could be a normal Christian or a particular type of church, could be another religion. The Muslims are not understanding why we don't follow Islam, or Hindus are not understanding why we don't follow Hindus, Hinduism, or uh, the Catholics thinking why we don't say Hail Marys. We don't understand our ways of following their religious ways of thinking. The worldly people can't understand why we don't get involved in partying and drinking and other worldly activities. The complacent people think, why can't you just let me live and let live? You know, why do you have to come and preach to me? My life is good. I'm happy sitting at home. I don't hurt you. Why? I don't hurt anyone. I don't bother anyone. Why do you come and bother me with this gospel stuff? I know if you know people who've said things like that. You know, I have. So they're not particular bad people as such as. Um, they don't do drugs and they don't get drunk and they, 
and they just want to be like them. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus, they have they got no, got no interest in Jesus at all. From a kingdom perspective, this old way of life is insignificant as it has no eternal value, no eternal worth, and it focuses only on the self-life here and now. It doesn't focus on, on God and His kingdom, it does not seek the kingdom of God, it does not seek, it seek the glory of God, and it focuses on the self-life and the here and now. You mean even the religious? Yes, even the religious. Why do we say that? The disciples and the Pharisees. It wasn't about the glory of God. It is what must I do that I can do what is right. Not to please God, but what is the right thing to do? And that's what religion really says. What is the right thing to do? And it doesn't need God. Because as long as I'm doing the right thing, I might get the blessing of God, you see, and I won't get a curse. It's not about, it's more about appeasement of God than loving God and seeking the glory of God. You know what appeasement is? <coughs> appeasement is a sacrifice that a lot of religions offer in order that God will be pleased in that He won't bring down curses and harm on us. It's more, God, take the sacrifice and I'll offer it to you so that your wrath might not come upon me. So I'll please you, please you enough, not please, please in the sense of relationship, but please you enough to say to withhold your wrath. That's more of a reaction to you know, an action out of fear that God's wrath won't come upon us rather than to say, I want to please you because I love you, because I know you all love for me. I want to see your glory come on earth. I want to see your will be done. I want to be pleasing to you in a sense that when you see me, I put a smile on your face, Lord, and you rejoice over me with singing. That's the pleasing of God that Jesus wants us to have. Not the appeasement of God, just the withholding of wrath. Jesus has already done it. He's already done that. On the cross, He took God's judgment on us to appease the judgment of God over us and for all who believe judgment has passed over us. We don't have to try and appease God. All we have to do is believe what Jesus has done on, for us on the cross. He has already appeased God. He has already withheld judgment from us. If we believe in Him, we have passed over from death to life. Judgment has passed over us. We don't need to do all the religiosity to appease God. In fact, that only brings upon the wrath of God because if we try to live according to the law and we do not do it and we Break one law, we've broken the law. That's what James says. And therefore, if you've broken the law, you still under the wrath of God. And if you're under grace, then that's pleasing to God. He sees not what we can do for Him. That's what religion is. Not what God is doing for us, but what we can do for Him. Grace is not what we can do for Him, but what He has done for us. And Jesus wants to take hold of us by grace that He can forgive us, He can set us free. And to say, this is significant. Because what He does for us is what is significant in the kingdom, not what we can do for Him. We respond to His grace and serve in Him, yes, but not to try and appease Him, not to try and win His favor. His favor is only found at the cross. And when we come and kneel at the cross, that's where we find the favor of God, not by doing religious stuff. That religiosity is of the past. The new life is about Jesus, Matthew 9 15. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will take. Will be taken from him and then they will pass. Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. A word that is translated as guess is with us. 
which actually means sun. It's a, not a, this is not a good translation of it, it's about the test of the bridegroom. What he's really saying are the sun of the children. The children, the sons, the relations. That's what it really should say, because the Greek is weird. But it should be translated as son. Or we can say children. What Jesus was saying was that his disciples were the sons of the children of God. And children of God make up the bride of Christ, the bridegroom. He is the, the, he is the bridegroom. He is the one. They are the, they are the bride. And they, yes, they, they, they rejoice in now because they are connecting with the bridegroom. When he's taken away, they will mourn. Yes, why? Because they're separated from the bridegroom for a time. But the time will come when they will be together again, the bride and the bridegroom. How do we come, children of, 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 uh, of God? Through faith in Jesus. John 1 12. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We become We've been in the right of children of God through faith in Jesus. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Have you believed in what he has done on the cross for you? If so, then you're children of God. And if you're children of God, you're part of the bride of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't this so much better than did? Religion. This is what Jesus is saying. It's not about that. It's about us. Our relationship as a bride and a bride crew. In love with one another. The bride of Christ and the church all believes in Jesus. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and reunite to his wife. And the two will become a flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about... Christ and the church, marriage of a husband and wife, leaving. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and unite to his wife. We need to leave the all to become united to our bridegroom, Christ. This is what he's doing. About. This is the, he's talking about the intimacy of a relationship, of a marriage relationship between us and him. Revelation 19, 78 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Find and it stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. God's holy people. Who are God's holy people? We are. We are. What does holiness mean? Holiness means to be set apart for. That's what it is. You set apart from the world to Christ. You set apart from the old religion to Christ. You set apart from your, your, your complacent ways, your indifferent ways to Christ, to dedicate yourself to Him and Him alone. You set apart for Him. And in being set apart for Him, we have become the righteousness of Christ, of God in Him. And that righteousness is imputed to us, is given to us freely as a gift, and it has a righteous art working in our lives that translates from an imputed righteousness, a gift of righteousness, to be works of righteousness by grace, not works, of, not attempted works to attain His favor, but righteousness because we have His favor. Does this make sense to you? And so the finally it stands for the righteous acts of us, our righteous works, our righteous acts. But when we have been set apart for Him, that we can live for Him. And on the day of the wedding feast of the Lamb, when we 
have been made ready. There will be the union of Christ and his church, Christ and his bride forever and ever. See, even in the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesied that God is the husband of his people. Isaiah 54, 5, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your demon. He is called the God of all the earth. Be the maker, your maker, is your husband. Your maker, the, he's the one who has made us, the one who has called us, the one who loves us. He is our husband. He is the bridegroom. Now Christ comes, Jesus comes and takes that title of bride and the bridegroom to be married to his bride, his people, his church. You are shed in a new life in place of the old. The new life found in him is based on the love relationship between a bridegroom and his bride. It is an eternal relationship. It is a pure relationship. It is a relationship for freedom and hope. It is a relationship of joy. It is not a relationship of old structure, rigid structure. It is flexible. It is, it is free. It is choice. You see, what woman thus we forced into a marriage? You see, you know, even in, even in the Middle East, even in places like Saudi Arabia, they arranged marriages. But you know that, that many times, not always, but many times, the call still has a choice. And they arrange the marriage, they get together, they put the, with the families, or they all together in the same room, but what's wrong with the families, and it depends the people themselves. And then afterwards, the girl is asked, do you want to marry him or not? In many families, not all, many times, Many times it's forced to will marry that boy, whether you like it or not. Many times the Lord is asked, you've got a choice. We're not going to force you to marry someone you don't want to marry. It's your choice. Do you want to marry this boy or not? They say yes, they go, they go ahead. And so it was arranged, and the marriage was ended. The girl says no, and it was someone else. So, that's, that's happens in many, in many uh, Arab homes. Of course, many at the time it doesn't. For the one that's forced to marry the, the boy that they don't want to, and the one who they, that they've got a choice, which would make the, the goal feel more that they get part of the decision and that they want to marry the person, which way it would make the goal happier. To do. That's what you think. I think the one who they've got the choice. Even though it's arranged, it's all arranged, but there are two attitudes here. One is forced on them, and then they've given a choice. And I know that both happen. And uh, you see, God doesn't force us to be pride. He gives us the choice. He says, I'm tired for you. I'm tired that you can be my bride. Isn't that awesome? That's how much. He loves his bride. He gave his life that you can and I can be his bride. That's the love that he has for his bride. But he says it's your choice. You can believe and walk and follow me. And you can be united with one day the marriage piece of the land. Or you can turn and go your own way. It's your choice. You see. We can have a choice in the matter. I choose him to be a problem. Do you choose him today? New life, new ways, Matthew 9, 9 16 to 17. No one, no one sews a patch of ancient cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. 
Man, I don't keep upon you one at all one's hands. If they do, the skin will burst. The wine will run out and the swine's skin will ruin. No, they pour new wine into new wine's skin that both preserve. The old and the new cannot coexist. If you want new life in Jesus, we have to do away with the old. We need to do away with the old religion. We need to do away with the old worldly ways. We need to do away with the old indifferent way of life. The old indifference to Jesus to say, I choose to follow Jesus. I cannot have that old religion. You know, you know what happens many times, and you'll see it in, in many religions, but even in Christianity, you get what is syncretism. Do you know what syncretism is? That's the mingling of the old and the new. That's the system that says he see you. They still have sacrifices. If you have sacrifices, what word is the sacrifice of Jesus? You see, in the past they had sacrifices, so they still continue with the old animistic religions, the old tribal religions, but they add Jesus to that. Jesus doesn't want to be shared. I will not share my glory, says the Lord. He wants us to do away with the old, the old religion, the old worldly life, the old wickedness, the old indifference, to be dedicated solely to Him, because that's what Jesus wants. Imagine someone hey, was together with a man, a woman was together with a man, whether it was, say, a marriage, or just a long partner. And now you want to know they want to get married. I mean, my husband. But they still want the old husband. <laughs> how does the new how does the new husband feel? <laughs> he says, you can help me, right? I'm not going to see you. He must decide. How they he will be. Isn't that not so? Now then, our oh, old husband. Is our old religion, all the world in the way of life, all the difference to Jesus. And that Jesus says, You and me, put that away. Put it away, die to it, let it be dead to you, and then you can have me fully. I will not shame my glory with them. See, we need to be filled with the new life of the Spirit and walk in His ways, be guided by Him. When he went right to him, there's a time when the bridegroom went full go. And then they'll fast. What does that mean? They will seek me in ways that I know, but I'll send them my spirit to be filled that they will so move me by my spirit. And they'll still have their relationship with me by my spirit. And they'll be guided into my ways by my spirit. That doesn't mean that we have become perfect, but the Spirit shows us the right way to do things. The new way to do things, the new life that is overflowing from us, from within us, from your innermost being comes the, the rivers of life. And this was what it's all about. This new life in new ways, to new things, to the glory of God, to the to the the, the joy of our Saviour, to the joy of our bridegroom Jesus, who is looking forward to having us with him for eternity. He shows us where we should put ourselves in the way of temptation due to the weakness that we might have. So we might say, I'm still struggling. I know Jesus, but I'm still struggling. Does it mean I'm not saved? What well, doesn't? It means that this with it. Is only in one side I'm still struggling. Does it mean I'm struggling? Do I know that the Holy Spirit? No, it doesn't. But don't you notice that we want to do something and we know it's wrong according to our, we want to do according to our life and, and we have this conviction. No, I mustn't do that. So you're not perfect. 
but the Holy Spirit is on at work and he's saying, don't do it, don't do it. Now Joseph, Joseph is alone with Potiphar's house and, and she makes an advance at him. And what does he do? He turns and he runs. And the Spirit of God within him says, yes, you're a man. You should be in the situation of the ones you walk for. Get out of here. You see, and the Spirit of God knows our weaknesses. And he says to us, I see that you're not perfect. I see you still in process. I see you still weak according to your old weaknesses of your old life. That hasn't been refined yet. But he guides us to say, and when he sees us heading for the temptations of our life, don't, he says within us, don't do it. Now it's up to us to, to, to listen to the voice within us, who is the Holy Spirit, guiding us into the ways of Jesus. And that we are going to yield to our old temptations, or we can yield to the by listening to what the Spirit is saying to us. Because the new life, the new wine, is the life of the Spirit within us. New structures. You see, we're not following the legalism of the law anymore. Now it's choice of grace and the Father God through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit brings transformation into our lives in accordance with the new life that Jesus has given us. In other words, we don't say, well, I'm full of the Spirit, I'm full of grace, I can do what I want. No. He brings, He shows us the right way. He also changes according to, to the new life that is within us. Changes us to be Christ-like. And we're in the process of that transformation. Galatians 5, 16 to 17 says to Andrew, I saw I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires of what is contrary to the Spirit. The spirit works contrary to the flesh. That flesh on us all wine skins, we can't put it away. We need to die to it. We need to live by the new life of the spirit. That if we live by the new life of the spirit, keep in tune with the spirit, we'll not gratify the flesh. We will be too focused and too busy looking and listening to what the spirit wants to be able to have time to even consider the things of the flesh. And the old world and ways of life, the old religion, the old things that we need, we need to die with, that we can be the pleasing bride of Christ, the bridegroom who loves us and is waiting for us. Are you pleasing to God this morning in the way He has given us new life, with new life, new wine skins, the new wine of the Spirit? Are we walking accordingly? that we can be pleasing to